Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for a very entertaining panel to Kamal and his crew. Um, we, we won't have any bubble charts. Um, I can't promise that we'll knock our water over and spit it out. Um, but you will have 20, about 25 minutes of scintillating conversation with Dana Strong, uh, the CEO of Sky. Thanks so much for, for being here. Thanks very much for having me. I thought that the earlier session on, um, on consumption trends and on the different types of audiences was really interesting. And I wanted to ask you about delivery and how you, whether that's changing as well. Um, obviously, Sky was a, primarily a satellite business. You've moved aggressively into IP. Are you going to be turning off the satellite dishes anytime soon? Is that, is that on the horizon? Uh, first of all, uh, let me just say that the previous panel did an excellent job and uh, really got all of the creative juices in the room flowing. And um, so a lot of stimulating conversation there. And just, you know, thanks very much for having me today. Um, we talked a lot, I think, this morning about the transition to IP. Mm. And I think um, for those of you in the room that have seen it, I don't think Sky has made a big secret of our transition to, to IP. And so a couple of years ago when, uh, when I arrived, we decided that this was a very important key strategic pillar for us is to move our service onto a new IP-based platform. And this year, we literally blew the satellite dish up mm. in our TV commercials for anyone that noticed that. Um, because we, you know, seeing where the trends in consumption are going, we wanted to ensure that consumers had choice. Mm -hmm. And so what we think is really important about our new platform, and we call it Entertainment OS, is this platform feeds both our stream product and our glass product. And it's a very different integration of uh, the PSB services, so all of their apps are deeply integrated and a really good collaborative partnership with them. All of the major apps like Netflix, uh, Amazon, Apple, et cetera, all deeply integrated into the user experience. And then, of course, all of the uh, fantastic live linear content. And by making that, uh, um, by, by bringing all of that content to exist on one um, interface, I guess you would say, where that content is democratized, it means that customers don't have to go into an app, search and search and search, and then go into a different app and search and search. It's all there, and it what we, it accelerates really the speed to accessing your content, your speed to joy. So we think this is really important because the most, the most frustrating element right now on that, the volume of content choice that we hear about from consumers is how long it takes to find something right. to watch, right. right? There's all this choice, but it takes a really long time to find something to watch. So what we really are doing is using the IP platform in order to uh, solve that problem. To streamline really it. That better. Yeah. For, we've, we have millions of customers that love their service on the satellite dish with the Q platform. The Q platform is amazing, by the way. We have no desire to disrupt them, but we want to give the customers the choice. And so what we're finding now is the vast majority of customers that are signing onto our service now are start signing onto the IP platform, and mm -hmm. eight out of 10 of them are new to Sky. So it's opening up new headroom for but us. But uh, no switch off anytime soon, right? No. OK. Um, and how's Sky Glass gone? So I know there were some bumps in the road. Um, are you happy with how it? Actually, pretty sales. delighted with it. Yeah. So consumers love it. So those that have it, love it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in July, we were the largest 55-inch uh, TV in the country, which is fantastic. And then um, for the full year we've had so far, we're the fastest selling 65-inch UHD. So for, um, for a product that isn't in retail, and the vast majority of TVs are sold in retail, mm -hmm. we're pretty excited with that, with, okay. that, uh, with that speed of adoption. So you've, you've been at Sky for three years now, I think, 21? Just under. Yeah. Um, and you came in after the, the deal, after the, the, the sale. I did. Um, so I covered that. I mean, a lot of people remember, remember the, the, how long that process was for the, for, for the sale. Um, and I think there was an expectation at the time that Comcast really wanted the European footprint that Sky has. Um, has it worked out like that? I mean, is it, where, where would you say Sky now fits within the sort of Comcast portfolio? So believe it or not, the acquisition was five years ago, yeah. um, which is quite a long time. And I think uh, when you reflect back on it, it was quite visionary um, to, to do the deal five years ago. JD and uh, Jeremy and um, Brian, I think, had a really uh, prescient vision that they needed uh, to give scale um, to both of their business, but to put specifically, I think the Sky business really benefits from Comcast scale. Mm. And to have foreseen that back in 2018 when the deal was done, I, mm. I do think was quite visionary. You know, what I would encourage Evan to do is a chart on free cash flow. 
um, and what would that bubble look like? Um, and uh, you know, for, from, from a scale standpoint, you know, Comcast generated more free cash flow than Netflix, Warner, and Disney combined in 2022. Right? So it gives us a very important and solid foundation from which to make investments in order to innovate for the Sky business and the Sky customers in which to grow. But, but, is, but is Sky fully aligned as a European company with your different businesses? I mean, there, there have been reports that Sky Germany is on the block and you're thinking about selling it? Is yeah, so Sky, so how I would describe, so Sky is in six countries as the Sky brand. Mm. Uh, so UK, Ireland, Italy, Germany, Austria, and uh, Switzerland. And then we're in 22 countries, uh, additional countries in the Sky Showtime brand. In each market, I guess you'd say we're in a different point of the maturity curve. So in the, in the UK market, we have a fully integrated suite of services from everything from our original TV product all the way through now protect home insurances mm -hmm. and communication services in between. In Italy, we're halfway through that maturity curve. And in Germany, we're a little earlier in the maturity curve. We're in both pay TV and streaming. Mm. In, the, in the German market, you know, the, Germany has been a notoriously difficult market for pay TV. I mm. think everybody you know, knows that the German consumer has always gravitated towards free content. Mm. What's amazing is that in Germany, there's, where, there's never been a bigger, better time for pay TV in Germany, right? We're, we're at an, a peak in terms of paying households. It's gone up by 60% in the last uh, five years. So, and that's really uh, as a result of a lot of growth in streaming. So what we, when we look at the German market, we think that in that market, the opportunity for our streaming service, which we call Wow There, still has some really important potential. We've just locked in a really great uh, management team, a new CEO. We're very clear-minded about what we want to achieve in Germany. And what I would say is we are fully aligned across uh, Europe, but we tend to approach each market depending on where the maturity curve, the consumer, and the regulation uh, you know, really optimize our performance. So in a, in a market like Poland, as an example, the best way of approaching that market would be through our partnership with, um, with Paramount in the Sky Showtime venture. Uh, because we really look at that and go, what's going to matter to consumers there is a very, very big portfolio of choice at a, at a good price point. So putting the powerhouse of the universal content, the Paramount content, Sky content together under one roof, we don't have to duplicate management teams, infrastructure, et cetera. It just makes it so that more of the money we're spending is for the on screen and less of the money that we're spending is for platform and, and people. Right. But does just to go back to the original question, I mean, is Germany still central to the portfolio? I mean, do you anticipate it staying within your... I, I, I think Germany's got a lot of potential, and absolutely the, the announcement of the, of the new CEO, I think, is, is, is all the evidence right. we need that we're in it. Okay. Uh, now, you've got a report coming out today. Um, we wrote about it in the FT on uh, the red tape that's stifling the creative sector, the creative industries. I just wonder if you could elaborate on it a little bit in terms of regulation you'd like to Absolutely. see removed or, or, or binned that could help, help the sector grow? Absolutely. So one of the five key growth sectors that the government has identified is the creative economy. And we were delighted about that because we obviously feel really, really passionately about it. Mm. So one of the things we wanted to highlight is what the growth potential is in the creative economy, uh, which we believe is, um, is over 10 billion um, pounds over the next 10 years with an incremental 2 billion in tourism. So it's really, really important component of the economy. But if we're, if we're really, really honest, you would have to say that the creative economy is a fragile economy. It's an economy that if it doesn't get the right support and doesn't get the right regulation, I guess you would say, mm. um, it can really unwind quite quickly. Why is that? Well, it's a, it's a project-based economy. So somebody you know, shows up, does a movie, it takes 12 months to shoot a movie, they go on to the, to the next project, the next territory. So if you don't have the right tax regime that's welcoming those communities to locate here in the UK, you can find that those projects move to other territories very quickly. So right. what we wanted to do is highlight uh, both the opportunity for growth, because we think this is one of the very, very most important and unique components of, of the UK, is how, how incredibly prolific we are, 
um, in creative content. And to make sure that we protect that, foster it, and grow it, we wanted to come up with some practical recommendations. And you know, protecting the tax regime is a really important component of it. Mm -hmm. Really emphasizing how do we, um, how do we uh, match the growth ambition by getting skills in, into the economy, training people up apprentices, and uh, making sure that we're moving a bit faster on new studio spaces and right. new infrastructure so that allows this economy. Like that. So there's there's quite a lot yeah. uh, that can be done um, and needs to be done in order to protect this this very fragile opportunity. But it is a massive opportunity. And do you think government will listen? I mean, we've got Lucy Fraser talking to Alex later. Um, she, she's, a, I think, the 12th cult, cult secretary in 13 years under the Tories. Labour, by comparison, had six in 13 years. I mean, do, does this government care about media and creative industry? So there, no doubt there has been uh, a lot of change um, and uh, in, 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 in terms of the, the office. Personnel. I, yeah. And what I would be... Um, so, so you're right to acknowledge it, but... Uh, what I would say is today, there are a couple of things that I would say feels different. Mm. And the first is that um, from the time that Lucy Fraser became Secretary of State um, of Culture, and I believe that was February, so we're not quite a year in. Um, I just am getting my timings mixed up, but I, I think I'm about right. Mm. The approach has been a very open door to the community. And so the accessibility for us to be able to go in and say, these are our concerns, feels, um, and congratulations to that team, uh, feels like much more collaborative, much more open door than it has in, at different times. The other thing I would say is around the uh, cabinet table, there's something to your point around um, the well, personnel We've all been culture secretary at one point, right? But Pretty now, much. but there's something like so. four or five yeah. ex secretaries yeah. of state the benefit for culture. Of a revolving door. Actually, you've got to admit yeah. Yeah. that's quite helpful, yeah. including um, Jeremy Hunt, you know, yeah. Chancellor. So Oliver Dowden, right. uh, and Oliver Dowden, yeah. really influential members of cabinet, uh, had gotten a big, um, a big step up in their careers in that chair and have a passion for it and yeah. an emotional attachment to the importance of the creative economy here, which I think is one of the reasons why it's in the top five focus yeah. areas. And so I think that is also symbolic of this government taking it seriously. Now, we need to start delivering on that. We need to make sure we protect it. We need to make sure we kind of lean into it. Uh, but I do think, and every, everyone that I, th I think has spoken earlier today is really focused on how, um, how, the, how we have a unique voice and we have a unique talent in regard to creating content that both matters locally and also travels incredibly well. Mm. And we need to make sure that the UK fosters and develops and grows that and doesn't lose sight of that opportunity. Right. But to this point about continuity in, the, in that office in particular, do, I mean, we may have a Labour government next year. Do you have a sense of what they would do for the creative industries? Do you think they'd do a better job with the creative industries than the, the current? The current uh, Couldn't uh, speak for what their policies are likely yeah. to be, except to say that they've also demonstrated a real willingness to engage with business. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm optimistic that the opportunity here is so obvious, and even with, hopefully, with, with this new report, with the support of, of Public First and Oxford Economics, that it really shines a spotlight on how we need to make sure that regardless, I guess you would say, of any personnel change, as you've called it, yeah, yeah. that this, this continues to be one of the key focus areas of growth for the UK economy. Okay. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, um, we're, I'm just interested in the, the slides earlier on in the discussion about younger audiences, we touched on that. Um, sport seems to me a great way to mm. attract a, a pretty, you know, an, an audience that are across the sort of age spectrum, and you obviously have a lot of live sport. The Premier League rights are up shortly, I think, or being, the, the, are being discussed currently. Can you talk a little bit, a bit about where those rights fit within your plans for within Sky going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the Premier League has been a 30-year partnership. And, um, and I might add, I think, is one of the UK's, it's, a, it's an incredibly important cultural export as well. I mean, it, it in and of itself is, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful sport, wonderful cultural icon. We all gather together in those live moments. I think uh, Evan was saying yeah. how important these, these live moments are. 
um, and will live local will continue to be what really drives behaviors and emotion. Um, sport is at the very epicenter of that. So we feel that sport is an incredibly important part of not just our heritage, but also our future. Yeah. So Premier League is an absolutely important part, um, but it's one of many uh, that we have in the portfolio from EFL to Formula One, cricket, of course, NFL, tennis, kind of you name it. And we're, we're, we're in a very strong position because we've locked in rights for very, multiple, multiple years, you know, many out to 2029, 20, 2030. Um, I think that the, the, the incredible relationship with the Premier League has generated a lot, of, uh, a lot of global interest in the Premier League. It's in a great position. It's very, very well run, well managed. Mm. We love the role that it plays in our business and we hope that that partnership continues for many years to come. Our focus area of the last year or two with the Premier League has been to make sure that we're growing uh, audiences, we call it expansive fandom. So one of the things that, you know, as, as an example, Formula One has really brought in uh, a very, very young demographic and um, a lot more of the female demographic. And so how can we ignite um, more passion from female fans into football? Mm. And of course, the WSL is a huge component of that. And we're really, really proud of our coverage of that. But also just thinking very thoughtfully about where we show up, you know, really changing the way we show up in YouTube and social media, as an example, mm -hmm. um, really thinking about our commentators, really thinking about how we engage of storytelling to bring women in and under 35s. And we've had a really, really impressive growth over the last 12 months around bringing women in under 35s uh, up in, in, into the sport. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're feeling quite good about that trajectory of ensuring that local, live, these passion points of sport are appealing to a broader set of audiences and not just the, the, the traditional. Did, did Netflix do you a favor with that, with, with F1? I mean, Drive to Survive has been so popular. I mean, well, it wasn't for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But it definitely helped the sport, yeah, well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, and on, on the WSL, how long is your... How, how, how long are you sort of locked in with, with them? Uh, WSL, we have one, a bit over one more year mm. um, with, the, with women's football. Right, right. Um, are you expecting, I mean... The, Hopefully much longer. But, but just, just going back to football, are you expecting um, Disco Brothers, as we now have to call them, um, to make a big, um, a big play for, for rights now that they've sort of absorbed BT Sport? I mean, they're, they're pretty, you know, they have their own problems and their own debt issues, but it would be a, a good way to take a bigger stride into the UK, wouldn't it? Look, it would be, it would be perilous of me to start um, uh, predicting what outcomes the auction might have, which is coming up in a couple of months, and um, let alone try and predict what's, you know, uh, what, what some of the strategies would be. What, what I would say is the important thing that we focus on is um, we have a very long-term mm -hmm. carriage deal with BT now, TNT Sport, uh, which means that we can, regardless of which game is showing up at which slot, so whether it's Saturday at 12.30 or Sunday at 4.30, um, it's on the Sky platform yeah. and the customer has the choice. Right. And so I think we feel like we're in a very good position regardless of how that, that, okay. that comes about. And similarly to football in terms of central importance, your HBO deal, um, which creates a lot of the programming on Sky Atlantic, that's up in 2026, I think most people here will have watched you know, Succession, White Lotus, Last of Us on, on Sky. I mean, if that program is taken away, if HBO goes over the top or goes direct in Europe in three years, is that gonna cause you a big problem? So I, I guess the first thing that occurs to me is um, clearly Matt isn't, uh, you, you've given me all the tough ones, right? Yes. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, 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 so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, one has to expect that. Yeah. Warner is up in 2026. Yeah. We have a very long history of um, partnership with Warner, and we think we have represented that content extremely well mm -hmm. and built brands and fandom and audiences for that content very well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, I, I think we're really well known for creating environments where our partners can get a, a more economic benefit by working with us than working against us. Right. We bring audiences efficiently to content 
and we allow everybody to share in the economic benefits of that, including the consumer who gets to pay a better price because we're able to aggregate services, much like we aggregate Netflix in, we aggregate the Paramount Plus service in, mm. Warner's is in, all of our universal content is in. So we're quite optimistic that the logic, I guess you would say, um, of doing business together so that both parties have a better outcome in a market will be able to find our way through that. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think Warner and, and David Zlazov have gone on record complimenting Sky on its uh, extraordinary success in distribution in our markets. So we've got a lot of years ahead of us before we really confront that. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I would say is the, the, the narrative or the, you know, the public discourse around D to C only changed a lot when Discovery came into the Warner, Warner family. And, yeah. uh, and you can see their global model really varies by market. Well, I guess so, it changed a lot with the big Netflix correction of whenever it was last year. It did. There was, there was yeah. even more of a, of, a, of a shift in that. But if you, if you look at how they collaborate with distributors in the United States, mm. you know, there is a symbiotic relationship there. Yeah. Um, you, do you, just going back to the, the Comcast question, um, there was a big write down on the Sky purchase, which probably would have been painful for people within Comcast. I mean, is that behind you now? Do you anticipate, are there others looming? I mean, do, there, is the company now well entrenched and is it going forward in terms of its value and its position within? Yeah, so, that, so let me clarify. So that was, um, that was a non-cash charge, essentially yeah. an accounting uh, moment where you take into account everything from interest rates to macroeconomy to foreign exchange. And that, you know, that is behind us. And we're, it's clearly in the rearview mirror and we're looking forward. We're collaborating more and more with Comcast across technology, uh, across the Peacock platform, across content, mm -hmm. and, um, and feeling very good about that collaboration going both ways. And so, you know, the Entertainment OS platform was actually started and conceived of here at Sky was invested in with the global scale of Comcast's cash flow, but is now the foundation of the relationship between Charter and Xfinity or Comcast Cable in their new Zumo rollout, which is their new video platform. So you can start to see the organizations working to optimize technology and content platforms across the Atlantic. And one of the things that I would really compliment Comcast about is that when they acquire a business, and they're very thoughtful about both you know, if, who, when, but also they're very, very thoughtful about that integration. And so instead of Comcast coming in and taking over an organization, they tend to allow the entrepreneurship and innovation flourish in the organization, learn that business, and over time figuring out how they can use the assets across both organizations to accelerate growth for both. Mm -hmm. And so that's been the five-year evolution, I would say, of Sky's role within Comcast, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we feel really good about that partnership. And as I said at the very, very beginning, I think it was really um, strategically insightful five years ago to combine the Sky business so we could benefit from that global scale, because those charts, unless you rewrite them as cash flow, those charts that Evan had up before are very, uh, you know, very poignant. What about um, your, so your public service commitments through in, within Sky? I mean, that you're, well, you have your partnerships with the PSBs who are, who are here, but I was thinking about the, the relaunch at Sky News and the sort of commitment to, to news. You have new, relatively new Absolutely. leadership Absolutely. So Claire David mentioned Rose. it before, where Comcast um, had to uh, secure, I guess you would say, a long-term support of Sky News. And so that was a commitment to spend a um, hundred million pounds a year in Sky News until through 2028 with ed full editorial independence and CPI increases. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I feel really proud about that. I'm deeply <laughs> proud of Sky News. Um, it's also helpful that there's editorial independence, so if anyone gets upset with me from the Department of Communications and it's Culture, on you. <laughs> it's um, editorial <laughs> independence. Um, John Riley created an extraordinary uh, track record of Sky News, six times mm -hmm. running News Channel of the Year for RTS. Um, we, you know, was a leader with such high integrity, and uh, will forever be grateful to the quality of news service that he's built. 
but you do eventually have to let people retire. Yeah. Um, and as much as we would like to keep them, the new team is fantastic. So David and Jonathan have hit the ground running. I think uh, people would have seen our announcement on the new way that we're bringing um, to life, I guess you would say, the same integrity and authenticity and quality journalism, but in the evening formats, we're bringing it to life in a very different way with, um, with, with a whole new lineup of Yalda doing our international, of course, Sarah Jane doing local, and Sophie doing, um, doing the political. Do you, th you think there's more audience in the evenings for, in prime, prime time? Uh, uh, yes, the American we model, do. right? So, we do. Yeah. yeah, we absolutely do. We think that there is a real opportunity. And then to con once you get the audience, to continue them through, and of course, culminating. We've always had great track record with our, our sort of newspaper review in the, in the 10, 10, 30 slot. Yeah. So I'm feeling quite good about where the future direction of Sky News is going and really reinvigorated, I guess you would say, with some of the new ideas that the new team is bringing to the table. But it's all built on the, on the shoulders of, um, of the giants that preceded them, for sure. Fantastic. Thank you. The, the red light is flashing, so I'm going to have to wrap it up there. But can I thank you so much for Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. Thank you.